Test, test. Well, good evening once again, and welcome to Motor Gospel Chapel. Um, you've come to expect candor uh, from our little fledgling broadcast. This is a lot more, I always tell people, this is a lot more Wayne's World than it is TBN. And uh, tonight uh, will, will not be any different. Um, I have some candor for you. I'm not feeling very pious tonight. I would love to say that I am. Um, but I'm not. I've spent a, an exhausting week navigating a, navigating a just a bureaucratic nightmare regarding uh, the health care system and medical benefits. Um, and uh, I thank God. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. I don't have an ungrateful heart. Uh, we could live in a, 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 a time period when they're still using leeches to bleed people who are sick instead of having relatively advanced medical technology and um, uh, relatively stable medications and things like that and herbs and supplements. Um, we're truly blessed to live in the abundance that we have here in America, um, to have wonderful, wonderful health care, comparatively speaking. I'm not ungrateful for any of that. But I just got to say, I'm, I'm, my mind has not been very focused on scripture um, for the past several days. My mind has been reeling as I deal with uh, navigating the, the health care system. Uh, our medical benefit situation is different now in full-time ministry. You know, after 30 years of being in a day job and having all that kind of stuff uh, sort of taken care of, spoon-fed to us, um, and now COBRA just ran out, which was sort of a leftover thing for about 18 months after uh, leaving the space program. So now this is the first time that we're really kind of on our own. and. Uh, uh, this may be old hat for those of you that are self-employed, those of you that have been in ministry for a long time or whatever, but it's all new to me. I'm just absolutely exhausted. I'm fighting a cold now. Um, I'm, I'm recovering nicely from the spinal meningitis. Now I have the much more common cold. Um, but all of that to say I'm tremendously exhausted. I'm not feeling like a very pious spiritual man right now. I, uh, my head is just full of uh, all kinds of uh, bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, medical Benny stuff. So that's a perfect time <coughs> to get together and try and rest at least a little bit. Um, our service will be abbreviated tonight. I want to go to bed early. I need to get some rest. Um, I did have a tremendously fruitful day uh, with Brother Howard Lloyd and uh, uh, his pastor, uh, Eddie, at uh, Victory Outreach San Fernando. We had a really good meeting this morning to talk about the Motor Gospel Peace March. And the uh, documentary for the Motor Gospel Peace March is complete now. It will drop any day now. It'll be released shortly. Um, uh, Neil Newman and Shoot Cut Deliver did a wonderful job on it. Um, but uh, mostly I've had medical Benny, bureaucratic nightmare stuff on my head. And uh, keeping the candor thing going, I'm not feeling very pious. But I am glad if you've joined us. And uh, this is a perfect time to rest when, when we don't have it all together and not looking real flashy, um, this is a good time to, uh, to just rest and uh, uh, give thanks to the Lord uh, for he is good. <coughs> so we're going to do that for a short while. Uh, we will have a bite later. Um, Sister Jessie is bringing sopes, uh, homemade Mexican cuisine later. Um, come by and join us if you want to. And uh, if you're with us at home, um, just join us in prayer and uh, in rest um, there will be plenty of battles to fight tomorrow, uh, but tonight let's just rest. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you that we have uh, uh, the opportunity for uh, medical coverage uh, such as it is. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd have mercy on uh, this country of ours. Uh, so much crazy stuff. Seems like such a simpler time uh, a few years ago but we know that you still reign. You are good and you are great, and we thank you for that. Praise you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't, we wouldn't put more trust in doctors and hospitals and insurance companies than we should.
Pray that we wouldn't take any unreasonable risks to which you haven't called us. But I also pray that we wouldn't trust more in the stuff of this world than we should. come for when my time has come for when my time has come give me Jesus give me Jesus 
Jesus, give me Jesus, you can keep this whole world, you can keep this whole world, you Give me Jesus, you can keep this whole world. Give me
Thank you for the green pasture by quiet waters, Lord. Thank you for the excitement that you give us, but thank you also for the green pasture by quiet waters where we rest. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. Yes. More, more of you in our lives. Yes, Lord. Less of us, Lord. More of seeing you in us, Lord. We thank you for, for your love and your faithfulness. Yes. Thank you for your hand of provision over us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we never go hungry because you always provide for all yeah. of us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your
bow down We bow down We love you, Lord We love you, Lord We bow down Yes. Jesus. you Jesus we love you Lord
praise you, Lord. Thank you for your rest, Lord. Thank you, Lord. surrender all to you, Lord. We bow down. We bow down before your throne. We bow down.
Take me past the outer courts And through the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people And the priests that sing your praise I hunger and thirst for righteousness But it's only found one place So take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me into the holy of holies Take the coals, touch my lips here I am Pass me by the outer courts And through the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people Priest to sing your praise I hunger and thirst for righteousness But it's only found one place So take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me Coals, touch my lips, here I am. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the coals, touch my lips, here I am. Take the coals, touch my lips, here I am. Take the coals, touch my lips, here I am. Here I am. Touch my lips, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am. Coals, touch my lips, here I am. Take the coals, touch my lips, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am.
like the coals touch my lips here I am take the coals touch my lips here I am take the coals touch my lips here I am Lord, before we get into the looking into your word a little bit, <coughs> I want to lift up uh, Eddie Clark's uh, loved one. Eddie asked for prayer tonight, and I don't, uh, I don't know the details, but you do, Lord. You know that a loved one of Eddie Clark's is in the hospital with something very serious, uh, open heart surgery uh, that wasn't planned or something like that. We pray for your healing hand to be on that whole family. We pray that Eddie and Marilyn would be strong that Eddie would be like a pillar that they could lean on. I thank you for his, his big fearless heart and his big strong shoulders. And I pray for the, the loved one of theirs, uh, whoever it is, to come through the surgery with flying colors. And we pray for uh, this uh, person, uh, I don't know if it's a, a boy or a girl, um, but their, for their loved one uh, to be saved if he or she is not already saved. Pray angels would encamp all around uh, the bed where, uh, where Eddie and Marilyn's uh, <coughs> loved one is lying. And we pray when their loved one awakes that they would have a newfound newfound reverence and fear of you and a newfound sense of purpose in life. I thank you, Lord, that I know who I am. I know who I'm called by and I know why I'm here. And I pray for Eddie and Marilyn's loved one that, that when he or, he or she wakes up out of this surgery, that if, if this person has never known uh, who he or she is, who he or she is called by, or why he or she is here, I pray even in miraculous ways that, that their loved one would wake up knowing who they are, why they're here, and who they're called by in ways that they never had before, that they'd see these things clearly as a result of the surgery perhaps for the first time.
I pray for all that have medical needs tonight, Lord, that whether it's the common cold or something a lot more serious, pray that you'd heal us all, Lord. And I pray the healing would not be superficial, but that the people would have their souls healed, their spirits healed. I pray that many would be saved. there would be miracles going on even if we don't see them that there would be miracles going on right now miracles that are more than skin deep pray for my friend Joey O. I pray that tonight would be the night. Tonight would be the night between him and you. Even if none of us see anything that between him and you, tonight would be the night. for Christine and we still don't know how to pronounce her last name but we thank you that she's willing to speak up where others are too afraid to pray that you use her in mighty ways I pray that you'd hone the rhetoric that comes out of her mouth if there are any areas where she's wrong but at least she's bold pray that you'd correct her Pray that you would always use her boldness, Lord. I pray for many more like her. Yes. 
Yes. We lift up Brewline Men's Fellowship. We lift up Victory Outreach San Fernando Valley. We lift up the Los Angeles Police Department. <coughs> we thank you for the unusual partnership amongst these, this uh, mixed group of people. We pray that it would bear fruit. Pray that you'd cause North Hills to be truly a safe city. Pray that many would lay down their guns and find other ways to settle their differences. from within and make us holy purify our heart cleanse us from within deep within refiner's fire my one desire is to be holy set apart for you Lord I choose to be holy set apart for you 
master, ready to do your will. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be Set apart for you, Lord, I choose to be holy. <laughs> Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. 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 We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful night. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that are here in person. Thank you for any that are joining us uh, around the world on the internet. Pray that your peace would be on them tonight. in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Now, Lord, as we prepare to uh, look into your word a little bit, uh, I pray that you'd protect the hearers if I say anything wrong. I pray that you would always, always, always cause me to uh, hold my own opinion in uh, much lower esteem than I hold your opinion, that we would always yield our opinions to your word. It's not wrong to have an opinion, but it's wrong if we elevate our opinion to the, the, the level of authority of your word. And if any of my opinions aren't right, according to your word, protect those that are hearing or even bring correction here in the chapel or uh, uh, in a, through cyberspace, through the chat tool or Facebook or whatever. I pray that our word, your word, would edify the hearers tonight. I pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to take about two minutes and I'll be right back. We're still live.
Okay. It's exciting. I guess it's sort of all right. Still getting used to the new uh, new setup. Um, I used to, uh, when I would speak motivationally in the schools, and this is going to be pretty short tonight, uh, by the way, I already told our listening audience um, uh, at home uh, that I'm not feeling very pious tonight. Um, <laughs> I spent about 20 hours on, on the phone this week uh, uh, dealing with... Um, horrible bureaucratic nightmare around health care benefits and stuff like that. And I'm not ungrateful. I'm thankful that we're in a country where we have some pretty good medicine and good doctors and stuff compared to many chapters of history. There were times in history where if you were sick, they'd put leeches on you. And, and <laughs> the drawing out of the blood by the leeches was supposed to cure you. Many people bled to death. It didn't work very well. There were times in history where if you were sick, they'd put you in the river with a, tied to a rock or whatever and if you sank, then they knew you were innocent. You weren't a witch or whatever. So you'd be exonerated. But if you floated, then they'd kill you for being a witch or something like that. I'm glad that we live in a time <laughs> and, and where, where we have pretty good medical care, comparatively speaking, to other times in history and other cultures. Um, but um, my head is so full of bureaucratic nightmare, um, being on the phone and dealing with forms and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm not feeling very, I wasn't feeling very pious or spiritual. Actually, after the last hour of sitting at the piano and praying with y'all, I'm feeling much better. That was tremendously restful for me. But nonetheless, between that and the fact that I'm trying to fight off a cold, um, uh, we're going to make it pretty short tonight. Uh, tonight's going to be kind of just a start on this topic. And then maybe if y'all are feeling ambitious, you'll even take some homework and you'll come back and help me finish the message next week. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be kind of fun, <laughs> right? So, when I so the, the sort of the big big topic, and then we're going to get to something very specific in the scriptures. The big topic is around identity. Um, we've talked about this in various contexts and various messages. When I was a motivational speaker during my 28 years in the space program, my employer would send me out to speak to young people in the public schools, and my employer always wanted me to get the young people excited about math and science. They didn't really care too much what the young people were wired for, what their gifting was. They just, they knew we had a shortage in this country of people that were good in science and engineering and math. Most of the people in the space program were coming from other countries. And uh, so they thought a solution to that would be to send rocket scientists like myself into the schools to talk to young people like Jerry and try and push them to be mathematicians or scientists, even if their only gifting was for playing like Eddie Van Halen or playing soccer or being a great businessman or something. Not everybody is cut out to be a rocket scientist, but they wanted me to push everybody to be a rocket scientist. I wouldn't do that because I believe not everybody is called to it. Not everybody has that aptitude. So I would try and make it a little bit broader, and I would try and appeal to, you know, I wanted to talk to the child that's uh, headed for MTV in addition to the child that's going to be a rocket scientist, the child that's headed for the Oval Office in addition to be a rocket scientist. Um, I wanted to hit most of the kids, not, not the one out of 100 that was going to be, you know, that wanted to be a rocket scientist in seventh grade or whatever. So I would start by passing around paper and asking the kids to write down if anything, <coughs> if anything was possible, anything at all, um, if they could do anything or be anything that they wanted to be and there were no limits, what would they be? And they'd, they'd write that down and then we'd bring them up and I, either I'd read them or the teacher would read them and we'd get all the, all the typical stuff. You get one or two doctors, lawyers, rocket scientists. You get a whole lot of MLS soccer players, octagon uh, people fighting in the ring, uh, fashion models, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, all the broad range of stuff, figure skaters, superheroes, of course, right? You know, if anything's possible, I told them no limits because it really helps sometimes to think about <laughs> what we want from life. Our dreams are useful for us to... Uh, battery. Okay. Um, our dreams are useful for us to understand ourselves. Even if they're unrealistic dreams, it's useful for us to understand ourselves. Well, one time in that whole exercise, and I did that for about 15 or 20 years out of the 28 years I was in the space program. And I loved that. That was one of the most cherished things I did. I was never quite sure if manned space flight 
really benefited mankind or not. I made my living off of it for 28 years, but there was always a debate in the back of my mind, does it really matter if we send people out there or could we send robots like what we send to Mars? We send robots, little vehicles and stuff, but they aren't people. We spent a lot of money and a lot of trouble to spend, send the people. And I was never convinced of whether it really mattered to send people or not. I loved sending people. It was tremendously exciting. But going to Magic Mountain is tremendously exciting. That doesn't necessarily mean it's benefiting mankind in a big, big way. So I was never sure. Whereas when I would go speak to the young people and I would get to touch these young lives and perhaps inspire somebody that was lacking confidence to pursue their dream, or teach them in eighth grade that they could be doing things even in eighth grade to lay the groundwork so they could go to college one day. You don't wait until 12th grade to go to college. You start much earlier than that. I had parents to help me start much earlier. A lot of kids, their parents don't know to help them start in eighth grade if they hope to go to college by the time they're graduating high school. I never had any doubt in my mind that that was valuable in the community. That one I was really sure about. Speaking to the young people, which was a tiny part of the job, that was one that I really felt good about. I never had doubt about that. But one time, in the 20 years of speaking to young people, I felt sorrow and regret in my heart. And um, a, little, uh, uh, a little boy of color, a little African-American kid, um, had written down that he wanted to be white. I had told them, no limits, no wrong answers, anything you can dream of, what would it be? If you could be anything or dream anything that you wanted, what would it be? And he wrote down that he wanted to be white. And the teacher was the one. This was a classroom where the teacher was reading them. Sometimes I would read them. Sometimes the teacher would read them. The teacher was this crabby, older, not very sympathetic teacher. And she chewed him big time. She, she, she tore into his butt for saying such a snide thing that he wanted to be white. And here I, I had gotten the kids you know, defenses down to speak sincerely about what he would do if he could do anything or have anything or be anything he wanted. And he answered me candidly and vulnerably. You know, a little 12 or 13 year old kid. Um, we're not that confident at that age. And, and she just absolutely chopped off his head when he was vulnerable. And I wasn't sure what to do. I was there on behalf of the Boeing company. I wasn't there on behalf of Motor Gospel or myself or whatever. I had to represent the company in a professional way. So I couldn't exactly say to the teacher, hey, you know what? <laughs> I, I wanted to smack the teacher, you know, for tearing into this poor vulnerable kid who candidly said what he wanted was to be white, if any dream could be true. And, and, but, but I kept my mouth shut. And I didn't defend him. And I was the one who had laid down the ground rules. I was the one who had said, imagine you could do anything or be anything. What would it be? And then, and then he got in trouble for it, and I didn't stand up for him. That was like the only time in 20 years I ever had any kind of regrets in, in this exercise with the kids. It broke my heart. I don't know where the kid is today. That was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I don't know where he, how he turned out, but uh, there are very few things that I would do differently if I had it to do over again. But if I had that to do over again, I would have stood up for that kid. I would have shouted down that teacher. She wasn't the one that asked the question. I was the one that asked, asked the question. I should have taken responsibility for the fact that the kid answered the question honestly. He said what he wanted. He wanted to be a different color. So on the subject of identity, there are always people that, oftentimes people that either they don't know who they are, they go through their whole life never knowing who they are, or they know who they are and they want to be somebody else. And those are both sad things. It's a tremendous, tremendous thing in Christ if, if we're blessed enough. Because there are even Christians that don't know who they are. And there are Christians that know who they are and they want to be somebody else. But if we can really come to peace, if we really, really, really surrender, not just sing the words, I surrender all, but live the words, I surrender all, you will tend to grow to walk in concert with Christ and you will know who you are. You will know who you're called by. You will know what you're here for. There's a tremendous peace that comes in knowing who you are and accepting who you are, accepting who Christ says you are. This little kid was black. He wanted to be white. I'm five foot eight. I, all my life, I thought I was like six foot four. I thought I was John Wayne. And it, it took a few, <laughs> Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, you know, Vin Diesel, whomever. It took a few times of my being badly embarrassed, you know, trying to stand up, thinking I was all tough, and then putting my tail on my legs, between my legs and running like, like a, a little girl. N nothing against girls for running, but I shouldn't have been running like a girl. I'm, I'm not a girl. <laughs> all right. Um, it took a few times of that before I finally believed that I was only five foot eight, that I wasn't John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. And no matter how badly I might have wanted to be something different, no matter how badly I might have wanted to be six foot four and have 24 inch biceps and think that I could walk into a bar and everybody was going to have to get out of my way, um, it simply wasn't true. That, 
Really? <laughs> it takes a while to learn that lesson sometime. Or is he actually six foot four and everybody? Oh, he is. Okay. <laughs> so I tried. It didn't work. That, that I wasn't equipped for that, you know. And um, um, I see. I see. I see. I see. So here's a little black kid that wants to be white. Here's a guy five foot eight that wants to be six foot four. Neither of us happy with who we are. Neither of us very accepting of who we are. And, and it really hurts. You can really, 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 really want to be a different color. You can really, really, really want to be taller than you are or something like that. But that doesn't change the truth. I look in the mirror. I'm five foot eight. I'm not John Wayne. People don't get out of my way when I walk into a bar, no matter how much I try and look like I'm swaggering or something, <laughs> right? Um, we saw a movie about a pastor um, where he wanted to be anybody but himself. He, he had been a pastor for about 15 years. He was really burned out. He was unhappily married. His wife hated him. His kids hated him. His congregation was not excited by his sermons. He was bored. He wasn't much of a man. He was ineffectual. Everything in his life was going wrong. And he prayed, Lord, please make me anybody but me. <laughs> he wanted to be anybody but him. He, wasn't, he was indiscriminate about it. He wasn't even thinking. And the rest of the movie, it was kind of like one of those fantasy movies like... Um, What's that one? Is it not Miracle on 34th Street? Um, it's a Wonderful Life where, uh, you know, it's a Wonderful Life, the, the uh, Jimmy Stewart movie. It's a famous Christmas movie, old black and white heartwarming Christmas movie where um, um, they always play it at Christmas time. Everybody watches it and gets sentimental. Jimmy Stewart has this really rough life. He, he works as a banker. He has a real humble job of some sort. He doesn't make much money. They live in a tiny apartment. Things aren't going that well with his wife and his children and stuff. He has a lot of stress on his shoulders. And, um, and he's about to commit suicide. He decides to end it all. I hope I'm telling the story right. I think it's Jimmy Stewart. And um, um, an angel comes and says, before you end it all, I want to show you something. And he walks him around the town um, uh, where Jimmy Stewart lived and showed him what the town looked like uh, if, if Jimmy Stewart never lived or if he committed suicide or whatever. And Jimmy Stewart, who thought he didn't have much of a life, when he saw a glimpse of what the town looked like without him, um, it was a whole different place. It was very evil. It turns out his life was very impactful, even though he was like a humble um, bank teller or something like that. So this movie was kind of like that. This pastor prayed, Lord, make me anybody but me. And the next day, he was an anorexic fashion model. And uh, he, uh, you know, a woman, 68 pounds, 5 foot 11, and um, uh, going through everything she went through and suffering through it and having an absolutely terrible time. And then he was um, a, a really horrible man who owned a business, who had no compassion on people, who had all the money in the world, but was really cruel to his employees. And he had a heart attack uh, relatively young because he had so much stress and stuff. He went through all these other lives till he finally got back into, oh, did he even become his own wife? And he became, finally he became his own wife and he saw what it was like being married to him from his wife's eyes. I forgot about that one, yeah. Yeah, so he finally came back to being him and then he was thankful to be him. He was accepting of being him and then he did a really good job at being him and once he put his heart and soul into it, once he stopped kicking against God, once he stopped fighting God and accepted, okay, I'm five foot eight, what do we do about it now? That's all the more we have to work with. What can we do with five foot eight? Well, I can drive a race car. I can rock out like Ted Nugent. I can preach. I can write. I can ride. Lots, lots of you can do at five foot eight. I'm just not going to be six foot four and have people get out of my way, right? So once he accepted who he was in Christ, things got a lot better. It, then it really flowed. He started working with Christ instead of against him. So on this topic, and we're barely going to scratch the surface, um, and this is a little bit of a reach. Uh, it's, it's, it's not exactly obvious how this scripture relates to what I'm talking about, but you'll see soon enough. Um, if you brought your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 19 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. 
to the Jews, I became as a Jew. And Paul was, in fact, a Jew. Under one definition of that word, he was actually from the tribe of Benjamin. It's complicated, but it's reasonably safe to say Paul is a Jew. Um, To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being myself without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. And these are a little bit complicated words. Don't worry, don't worry if you're not getting all the words. It's, it's a little bit complicated wording. You'll get the point momentarily. Under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. So what I want to focus on is, Paul says, I have become all things to all men. I have become all things to all men. And the the surrounding context (coughs) says so that... uh, you know, so that he can save more people, basically. In the name of evangelism, he's become all things to all men so he can relate to more people. So here's where we're talking about identity a little bit. Does this mean that Paul got plastic surgery so that his eyes would be almond-shaped, so that he would be better equipped to communicate with Asian people? No, it does not. Does this mean... Thank you. Does this mean uh, Paul uh, got, uh, uh, you know... uh, change the color of his skin so he could communicate more clearly with people who are of a different skin color. Clearly, it doesn't mean that. But many people use this scripture. Paul was all things to all men so that he could win more. And they use it to justify in evangelism today a variety of things that might or might not be okay with God. Does, does Paul say in this passage whether, for example, he held hands with people who worship other gods? like Baal. They didn't have uh, uh, Islam back then, but they certainly had other, other gods like Baal. They had other religions. If you take just this passage without the context, the context means the surrounding text, just this passage doesn't say what it means. He says, I've become all things to all men. So that could mean that he worshiped other gods, that he held hands with people and prayed to Baal. This passage alone does not tell you that. That could mean, he, right? Now, the rest of the Bible... Thank you. Correct? Does it, does it say he, he harnessed temple prostitution? Maybe he uh, used uh, uh, free drugs and, and uh, child prostitutes and stuff to win people to the gospel. This passage alone does not say that. Right? It doesn't say. Right, correct. It doesn't say he does or doesn't. It doesn't say whether he wore funny clothes to appeal to this sect of the population or this, that, or the other. It doesn't Thank you, right. So, right, thank you. So the thing we want to key on a little bit, I think Paul was not confused about who he was. He knew, I'll give you a little sneak preview, but I'll also leave you with some homework because I didn't want to take too long tonight. If you want to come back next week or email me midweek or call me or whatever, help me answer this question. How broadly did Paul become all things to all men? What was the range according to the rest of Scripture? Because that's the context that matters. This passage doesn't say if he got cosmetic surgery. So he would look uh, Asian in one context, but he would look, you know, uh, Jewish, Middle Eastern in another context or something. It doesn't say if he dyed his skin, so he would look uh, African in one context, but beige and Middle Eastern in another. It doesn't say. Um, it doesn't say if he engaged in temple prostitution or if he worshipped other gods. Um, it doesn't say if he... Um, uh, you know, kept kosher in one place, but ate bacon in another place, right? Um, and, and there are people today, I mean, we're laughing a little bit because we know the Bible enough to know the answers to these questions, but there are people today who use that, I have become all things to all men, very, very loosely. They use it devoid of the context, and they may be using it to justify some behaviors that Paul never would have justified. There are, there are people that today, you know, I've become all things to all men. Paul became all things to all men. So if they want to win, quote unquote, win Jews to the Lord, this is meaningful to me because I'm a Jew and I'm a Christian. 
they might act a little bit Jewish. They might hide the name of Jesus. They might not call themselves Christians because they don't want to offend the Jews. So that would raise the question, did Paul ever call himself a Christian? Was Paul ashamed to call himself a Christian? Or did Paul go right into the synagogue and talk about Jesus very clearly in a language that they clearly would have understood, right? So... Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Clung. Right. Right. It's like um, um, misrepresentation. Or that's right. Not, that's not quite the word I'm looking for. Right. Um, Bait and switch. Or yeah. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I get the concept. Right. So certainly not sincere, very disingenuous. So did Paul become all things to all men in a way where he would actually be dishonest about who he was or confused about who he was? Is he, is he anatomically a man? When you look in the mirror, you see clearly he's a man, but he's decided up here, he really feels more like a woman. You know, there was a time when if I walked into a psychiatrist's office at five foot eight and said, I feel six foot four, Therefore, I am six foot four, <laughs> and you will address me as the six foot four inch Aaron Schwartzbart. Um, they would have called that delusional. Somebody who thinks they are something they are not is delusional. If I walk in and say, I'm Jesus Christ, or if I walk in and I say, I'm Hillary Clinton, it would be clear to them, I'm having a delusion, <laughs> right? But now they've changed the rules to where even if I anatomically am a male, um, I can say, but I feel more like a woman. So call me a woman now. And for some reason, all of the psychiatrists have lost their minds. <laughs> I hate to say it. Or they have caved in. Uh, they've, they've given up their scientific integrity. And they haven't lost their minds. And they're just being very deceitful. Neither is a very attractive option for me. But clearly, they can look at me. They can take my pants off. They can see that I'm a man. There's no doubt about that. I might really, really, really want to be a woman. I might really feel like a woman up here. I might feel like a cocker spaniel, but I'm a man. <laughs> I'm not a cocker spaniel. I'm not a woman, and I'm not six foot four. Um, one moment, see if... Uh, will you take care of that? Thank you. It's Eddie. He, he had an urgent prayer request before, so you may want to uh, talk to them. Um, so... Clearly, I am what I am. I'm five foot eight. I'm a man. I might really feel like a woman, but I'm not a woman. I'm a man. And American Psychiatric Association has either lost their mind or they've lost their scientific integrity if they can't look at me and say, Aaron, I'm so sorry. I know you really wanted to be a woman, but that's simply not. You really want to be six foot four, but that's not you. You really want to be a cocker spaniel, but that's not you. They, they, uh, uh, we, we just, we are what we are. So I wanted to cut it short tonight. I'm fighting a cold. I'm exhausted. I had a bureaucratic nightmare to for the last week, not just today. So just in closing, take that as homework. If, if, if you're looking for a reason to open your Bible this week, and I hope you have many reasons to open your Bible this week. If you're looking for a reason to open your Bible this week, take away that question. When Paul said, I have become all things to all men in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what did he mean, all things? How broadly? Let's look at the context and study the Bible this week and come back and discuss it again next, uh, next Friday night. Um, for those of you that are home, thank you for joining us. If you're on your way, we look forward to seeing you shortly. If not, we'll see you next week. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for dialing in. We're out. <laughs>